you like it? Well, I've been saying that I received in September 25 questions. I, I put them all down here. I don't know what your idea of a format here is, or if, you, if anybody has questions, I don't think anybody does, but we can go right through these questions and see how we do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I'd like it to kind of be like what you originally said to me, where we both, both you and I, uh, mm -hmm. share our perspective on that topic. Because yeah, uh, the other time, it was somewhat uh, a lot of me talking about Jubilees, uh, which was, it was a good discussion, but I felt like it, you weren't involved as much as I hoped. That's my mouth hurt so bad at that time anyway. Am, am I uh, freezing up for you guys a little bit? No, you're looking good. Okay, because sometimes like when I'm moving, uh, the camera stalls for me. So I was wondering if it's uh, doing that for you guys. You have a new hairstyle? Uh, no. Uh, hold on one sec. I'm going to, I'm going to close out of, uh, I'm going to close out of a, a window. Uh, hopefully that'll make it better on my end. All right. Yeah. We, so we can, uh, we can start. You want to share the questions in the order you sure, want to? Sure. Sure. Okay. And we just invoke the presence of Yahweh Elohim in this meeting tonight. Let it come out to be something edifying and wonderful. Amen. Get this one. What are some cults that are actually not that bad? It's not exactly a biblical studies question, but it's a good question. Well, how about you go first? Okay. Well, of course, I've been accused of being a cult leader. I'm sure Andrew has too. Mm. No, a cult leader in the making. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that some cults aren't bad. I think that the, the definition of cult is simply a quasi-religious movement around a particular person. Now, the biggest cult in the world is Christianity. People around a person. The, the, the term is not judgmental. It's not pejorative. It's just so happened. So what's happened with that word cult is that it has been redefined by primarily the church to stigmatize its enemies there's some cults i believe are better than the church you know they follow torah if they're a democratic society if they give equal opportunity and rights to all people and if they are messianic to the degree of calling on yahshua as the messiah of israel and the world well, what's wrong with that? Yet they're called cults all the time. You know, not, not every cult is Jim Jones. They have to be evaluated on the basis by which you are looking for a particular group to be with rather than what your church friends or people around you that have no idea whether it is or not say it is. So the question is, what are what are some cults that are actually not bad? Well, the Vero Yahad isn't bad. It's, it's been called a cult. It's it depends, a good cult. It depends who you ask. Exactly. Exactly. All right, that's all I want to do with that. What do you want to do with it? Uh, so, so first of all, uh, I would say that... Um, I think lab labels are often designed to by a controlling group to try to delegitimize another group. Stereotyping. And, yeah. And so the word cult is considered, you know, negative connotation. Same thing with sect. 
um, in many ways, it has some negative uh, connotations. So uh, typically the, a mainstream group like mainstream Christianity will call a group a cult or a sect because it doesn't agree with their ideas. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't agree with that dismissal simply because it's different. But, you know, you have to evaluate the groups based on their teachings and their beliefs and determine for yourself if the beliefs are authentic or not. But even if they're false, uh, the thing is, I believe that, um, I believe that all, wait, one sec, sorry, okay. Um, I believe that all religious groups have truth in them and that uh, no matter which group you are a part of, you can find the creator. You can find ethical way of life. Uh, so I believe that no matter who you're born to, because think about it, if you're born to a crazy cult, let's just use the phrase crazy cult. If you're, if you're born to such a uh, group, it's not your fault that you were born in that situation. You'll be raised up in a group that is telling you the wrong thing. So what are you to do in that situation? You are to seek the creator the best of your abilities in that group. And I think, I think the creator, he looks at everyone's heart to, to see how they respond to what they're able to do. You know, some, someone who has a mental disability is not going to be judged as harshly as someone who knows better, uh, who has, who's fully aware of their, of their mental abilities. So uh, the same applies to what religion you're born into. Depending on what your religion you're born into, you won't be judged as harshly. Those who are born into Christianity, in many ways, will, will be held more, will, will be judged more harshly than someone who's born in, into um, uh, a Muslim group or a uh, Hindu or, or such, or a, a non-religious group. Um, you think that somebody born in a group like that, their mind will be ruined before they can uh, make a choice for themselves? And I wouldn't say that. I would say it would be corrupted, but not ruined in the sense of uh, irredeemable. Uh, I, I think I, I think each group, this is something I've been dabbling in in uh, the past couple of years, um, is something called comparative religion. And when you look at, at the different religions, they actually teach a strikingly harmonious message. Of course, the details don't always add up, but you have a lot of similarities. Um, the ethical teachings are very close. The theology in many ways is almost the same in all these different groups. So. There's different things like, you know, Sabbath is not taught in all the different groups, things like that. But in the main general concepts of ethical living and seeking the creator and worshiping him, you'll see that in no matter what group you're a part of. Um, so I believe learning from all different groups is a good thing. And you'd be hard pressed to find any group. Like if you want to talk about cults, in a sense of delegitimizing uh, groups, to, to be fair, you could pretty much classify every religion as a cult because every religion is pretty much completely off the mark in so many different areas of their beliefs. Um, so, uh, but in terms of dangerous cults, that's a better thing to speak about because there are, um, I wouldn't call, for example, uh, Hinduism a dangerous cult. I would call it a, it may be dangerous yeah. in the sense of spiritually, but it's not dangerous in the sense of it'll lead you down um, a really dangerous path. You're not going dangerous, to end up a murderer. Yeah, but there are groups, cults, um, who typically there are several uh, features of it where the the main leader the main uh, founder of the group is totalitarian. Um, you have to do whatever he says, whatever he says is the way. Um, and um, there's, um, 
often there is sexual abuse involved by by the leaders in that group and things like that um and people claim typically people are claiming to be reincarnations of they might say reincarnations of jesus or elijah or whatever but they're propping themselves up as these authority figures telling you what you have to do and you have to submit to them in every way mm -hmm. and those are the type of cults to stay away from would you consider that a dangerous cult then with a totalitarian leader that uh, demands to have his own will done uh, I yeah, would. I would. I would say that. Um, I would make a distinction between uh, the the Messiah himself and the apostles and the prophets, in the sense that when they spoke the words of the Creator, it was, in a sense, it was totalitarian. But they didn't present everything they said as totalitarian. Like it wasn't. You had to agree with them on everything they said. You know, uh, whereas these leaders tend to be more along those lines, I feel. So, like you anyways. could be punished. You could be punished if you, I'm just reading a book right now about a particular cult that on the outside was very, uh, very amicable with people. But on the inside, there was an inner track of these people that were murderers. One that's in the news a lot here lately is the 12 tribes. Yeah, so I was just about to mention the 12 tribes. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't so, know if there's any truth to those allegations or not, but those people are really nice. Yeah, so I would say that, that that's a group that I would not call dangerous in the sense that I was talking about earlier. And like, in the terms of totalitarian, they... As far as I understand, it's a committee. It's not a single person who is uh, telling you everything you have to do. And in general, they are living very close, not perfectly, but they're living close to the way of the Dead Sea Scrolls in many of their things. So um, I think it's a, I think there's a lot of value in, in the things they do, but I think they get some things wrong. And some of the things they get wrong, I think, are um, stripping people of their individuality yeah. Um, like you basically have, like I think you, I think you have to wear the same clothes. Like they, you have to wear the clothes they tell you to wear, um, sure. things like that. So there are certain things which are overbearing in that sense, but um, I don't get the same, I don't get the same sense of this is a dangerous cult that I do when I see these people declare themselves to be the reincarnation of Jesus, for example. Mm -hmm. Has anybody in here been in what you might call a dangerous cult? Kind of hard to find someone. For, for what, um, basically, people who believe for themselves uh, that they were part of a cult. Yeah, anybody here? Else we'll go on to the next question if we don't have any comments. Seventh-day Adventist. You think that's a dangerous cult? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> I used to be a Seventh-day Adventist. That was my joke for the evening. Well, I went to, uh, I worked in a Baptist church up until about 2016 for five years as a musician there. And it was definitely a dangerous cult. <laughs> Southern Baptist Church. Okay, second question. Yeah, next question. Is there any evidence of the existence of Paul of Tarsus that is Saul? Uh I missed the second part of the question. Is there any evidence of Paul? Of the existence what? of Paul. In general, is there existence yeah. of his? Um, so you want to answer? Oh, okay. I, I, there's no question that Paul existed. I think people get him mixed up with a um, guy from Tiana, Apollonius of Tiana. Mm. I did a, a show on him, a couple of them last year, and Besides the fact that their names are close together, and they may have both lived in Tarsus, there's absolutely nothing in common with the two. Yet the rumor keeps going around that Paul and uh, Apollonius is the same person. Now, um, as far as the existence of Paul, we have his letters. And here recently, I just got the Paul's letters that are redacted that took all the uh, 
in, uh, interpolations out of them and took out the last six books that are most people consider are Paul's. And I'm talking about Ephesians, uh, Ephesians, Colossians, and a few like that that have completely different theology. But to read the, his his letters, there there is no evidence that he is not a real person. But it seems like these rumors go round and round and round. You know, was Jesus really um, Moses, or was Akhenaten Moses, or did did um, did the twelve disciples actually exist? These kind of things. Well, we we don't have any evidence of any of that besides what we have in a, a few um, old texts, mostly what the apostles wrote, and certainly what a lot of what Akhenaten wrote, and surely. Paul wrote more than a few letters. It's just those things have been destroyed, and usually purposely. But if you if we have any evidence of anybody exist, existing at that time, it would be Paul. So I don't really consider that a very valid question. I think somebody could have really looked into the letters of Paul and made that decision themselves. We also have Paul that are, is interacting with different people that we know lived at that time. One group of letters from Paul uh, called um, Paul and Seneca. Seneca was in the imperial court of Nero, and was Nero's guardian. And we have a series of short letters between Paul and Seneca, which, of course, didn't make the scriptures. Uh, so we've got that connection. We've got Paul connecting with all kinds of people in Romans 16, the end of 2 Timothy 4, and these different places. And, of course, he names some people that are famous there. They're not just nobodies. And there are no Jews in there, by the way. There are people that are prominent in the Roman Empire, in Achaia, and in Italy. I think Paul existed. Sometimes I think they ought to put some of his writings in the back of the Bible as a, an addendum, because a lot of what he writes contradicts what the other ones write. However, that's even more of a proof that he lived, because there was a contradiction there between Paul and the Jewish disciples uh, that we find very clearly in Second Corinthians and in Galatians. What do you think? Did Paul exist? So, yeah, so I think he existed, but um, that question, I think the, the deeper issue is a, a um, skepticism of history in general. People oh, tend to be, um, the thing is, uh, uh, this, this happens a lot with Apocrypha documents. Uh, people who believe in the Bible, they take the Bible at face value historically, even though most scholars don't. Most scholars question a good portion of the scriptures of the regular Bible. But we have the mainstream Christians who then go on to say, well, the Bible should be trusted for everything it says, but the Apocrypha books um, should not be trusted at all. Um, but there's no basis for the reason why you can trust the, the, the books that happen to make it into the Bible and not these other books that had many times equally valid basis for being included in the Bible. So, yeah. um, so you you have to you have to develop a system of interpretation of history that is consistent and fair and makes sense. Now, I've adopted a system which is very controversial in the sense that it is not accepted by any mainstream groups. Um, be they religious or scientists or you know experts of the field, archaeologists would not agree with this process that I do. Um, just every everybody would disagree, but I have yeah. found that it it helps me a lot with um, learning about the truth and learning about history. And the, my principle is believe on default. Well, first let me say this. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard the thing 
the, the principle of innocent until proven guilty, right? Innocent until proven guilty. We are supposed to give the benefit of the doubt that, that the person speaking or doing something is innocent until we can prove otherwise or have um, some strong evidence that throws into doubt their reliability. So basically, um, I go with the approach that until we can prove or strongly suggest otherwise, anyone who makes a claim is to be trusted in their sincerity, in their sincerity. So what that means is that not necessarily everything they say is correct or accurate, but that whoever wrote it uh, believed it to be true. The person who wrote it believed what they were writing was the truth. With that process, you can actually tr you can actually um, read a lot of these a lot of this literature with an open mind without any bias whatsoever. Um, so when I when I read all these different documents, I don't have this bias in the back of my mind that says history has to be a certain way, and if it doesn't line up then whoever makes that claim is a liar or a false uh, speaker. So because my brain is open to whatever people are saying, uh, I can read it as people truly believing what they're writing. So how that works is, so for example, you have the book of Jasher. I don't accept the book of Jasher as uh, scripture or divinely inspired. I think it's a false document. Mm -hmm a lot of believers believe it's a true document due to the reference to Jasher in the scriptures. But I, through my study, I've concluded it's not a valid book. But the book doesn't claim to be written by a prophet. We don't know who even wrote the book. So using my principle, I can say that whoever wrote it was sincere in what they believed and truly believed that what they were writing in the book of Jasher was legit. Because of that, I can read the book of Jasher with an open mind and say, okay, this is what people believed at that time. Mm -hmm. When you apply that, however, to a book like in the Old Testament or the New Testament, these are books claiming to be written by a certain person. So like the letters of Paul, claiming to be written by Paul. So when it claims to be written by Paul, I believe using this principle that I've established, you can, you should on default assume that it's written by Paul. You shouldn't assume that everything Paul says is true, but you should assume that Paul wrote it because the, the person who wrote those letters is claiming to be Paul. And the only way for him not to be Paul is if he knowingly lied about being Paul. So, by the sincerity principle, innocent until proven guilty, you believe, you give the benefit of the doubt that the author is who he says he is. Because um, the only way for that not to be true is if they were um, willfully lying. Whereas for other claims made by Paul, he doesn't have to be a willful liar to be wrong. He can have completely false theology he could be a heretic, a false apostle, false prophet, and still he may have believed that he, like how many people have you talked to in your life who claim that God has spoke to them? Christians, oh. regular Christians. Oh, my God. They truly believe this. I don't believe they're making it up in the sense that I don't believe they knowingly are lying to try to trick people. I think they've deceived themselves into believing that God has spoken to them. Thoughts came into their brain, and they and the, the thoughts seemed foreign to them. The thoughts seemed like they were amazing thoughts that only God could do. So they concluded, that must be God speaking to me. And in general, they have a theological belief that God speaks to them through that kind of way, through coincidences. Oh, um, such a, I, I've seen on Facebook people talk about, oh, this number, 777, this is a sign from God. 666, this is a sign from God. Things like that. Red moons. Yeah, all these things, people assume that it's God talking. And then they, they, they extrapolate and say, okay, therefore God spoke to me. So when you read the letters of Paul, you don't have to accept Paul, what he says. But I believe through the innocent until proven guilty, 
you have to believe that he did in fact write those letters because he, it claims to have. Um, now with the law of Moses, for example, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it doesn't claim to be written by Moses. At least for Genesis, it doesn't. Exodus, it doesn't claim to be written. Now, it's a little bit different for like Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Good portions of those books are claimed to be authored by Moses. Um, but so uh, then there's things like there like are certain the temple scroll where it's written in first person. Yeah, the temple scroll written in the first person uh, is 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 uh, Yahweh speaking in the first person. So with that, for example, you could have two things with that. One, um, someone took Deuteronomy. Maybe this is this is what scholars probably would say. They would, they took Deuteronomy and said some someone took Deuteronomy and said, hmm. I bet this was originally in first person. Therefore, I'm going to change it to first person. Uh, so that is possible, but I think evidence is, supports the other direction that yeah. it was originally first person and scribes change it later. Um, but in this in the sense of innocent until proven guilty, um, you don't necessarily have to believe something is the truth to give the benefit of the doubt. Um, like, for example, the books of uh, Chronicles and Samuel, book first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. Those make claims about history. The innocent until proven guilty approach does not require that you believe everything that those books say, but you believe that the author who wrote those books believed that what they were writing was true history. So why did the author of those books uh, make those claims? They had to have had earlier sources for which they were basing their, their claims on. Whether those claims are true or not, they had earlier sources that they were using. Um, so for me, I just, I accept using this principle, I accept pretty much all the Apocrypha books as scripture. But I interpret them to varying degrees of reliability because some are more corrupted than others. Um, but then when you apply it outside the scriptures, um, I read the documents of the Greeks, like Plato and Homer, for example. Uh, Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. He makes a lot of claims about, about the uh, Greek gods and all these different things about Troy and such. I, on uh, benefit of the doubt, believe that the basic nucleus of that story is probably true, but some of the details might be false. But the overall narrative, I, on um, benefit of the doubt approach, believe, without even reading the books, I believe that because of benefit of the doubt. And guess what? Scholars for many years, centuries, were doubting that the books of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, were reliable. They believed they were basically made up. However, in the last century, um, the Hittite documents were found, uh, and the Luwian documents were found, and in those documents, scho most scholars now believe that those documents corroborate many elements of the writings of Homer, showing that those those stories are based on historical events. Maybe some of the details are made up, but the the core concepts of the history are authentic. So, um, and like, for example, the, the, the gods, the various gods of the mythologies, the scholars tell you that, they, that these cultures just made these things up. But from the perspective of the, uh, the Essene faith, we don't have to believe that those other cultures made it up. We can believe, based on comparative uh, religion, that there were original true events that happened with the Nephilim, the Watchers, and that these events led to later generations uh, remembering those stories and passing them down to their descendants. 
so that's a long answer to the question, but I, I think that uh, if a book exists, that in itself is evidence that it's <laughs> that the uh, person existed, that, that it's being claimed, unless there's other evidence that strongly uh, demonstrates that that document is unreliable in that detail. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Okay, anybody have a question or an addition to that? Anybody have another question? It could be related or it could be uh, something sure. unrelated. And Jackson has other questions too. Uh, I have a lot of them. As I mentioned, if you weren't here, I get a lot of questions in my email and I got, looks to me like about 30 questions in, uh, in September alone. I don't have time to answer them all. So maybe some of these people, I'll just have them take a look at this. All right. Yeah, go to the next one. Here's another one. Why does the book of Acts end so abruptly? That's a good question. Jackson. All right. Well, mm -hmm. Paul is not dead in the end of Acts. Paul is going off possibly to Britain, certainly to Spain. Paul's accusers don't show up in Rome when he goes to trial before who I believe was, was his friend, Nero. I think that they knew each other through Seneca. And so it just, it's, it kind of wraps up there. He's not dead. You know, if it ended up, it said Paul got his head chopped off. Well, we would understand why that book would end. But the 28th chapter of Acts simply tells us that everything came out all right there in Rome. And he was preparing to take other journeys. And then, you know, we have this uh, Sonini manuscript that popped up, also called Acts 29, that continues on from Acts 28 and tells us about Paul's um, sojourn through Europe into Britain, then back, and there are other characters in there that we've heard of from the New Testament. So well, as far as Paul, I do not believe that Paul died in the Neuronic persecution because Paul was too close to Nero and Seneca and those other imperial people that he mentions in Romans 16 and in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And there's only really one witness that Paul was executed around 62 to 68. And that was somebody that lived three, four hundred years afterwards that said that in passing. It said there's a monument up here on the Ostia Road where Paul had his head cut off. So why does it, the book of Acts end so abruptly? There's another reason, possibly. I believe that the book of Acts was written by a man called Epaphroditus. I won't go into this, but... <clears throat> I have plenty of evidence that the person who we have called Luke is actually Epaphroditus, who was there during the time of Nero and the time of Paul, and who continued on through the time of Domitian 30 years later, and was a very close friend of not only Josephus, but of uh, Clement of Rome. And at the end of, uh, what we can do with this is we can see that Paul is writing after, the, um, after Josephus, probably undoubtedly, not Paul, I'm sorry, I get mixed up here, <laughs> that the writer of Acts, Epaphroditus, I'm going to say for the time being, had written his account of the Acts sometime around 90. 4 AD, because he relies heavily on Josephus' antiquities and Jewish war, so heavily that the two of them have correspondences that couldn't be any other way. But why would Acts be a little bit finagled in its history? Well, because at that time, if you got caught 
as the writer of a book about criminals, you got the same fate as they did. So in the, in the mid nineties, we've got Clement of Rome, a friend of Epaphroditus was executed by Domitian, his own cousin. We have Josephus probably executed by his own cousin. Why were they, why was Domitian executing these people? because they were converts to the Messianic faith. And Epaphroditus himself is executed at the same time. All these guys and many more in about 95. And then Clement of Rome's wife goes into a plot to kill Domitian and is successful. Domitian's dead but not until he had killed all the officials that worked in Rome that had become Messianic believers. I think that that's when the, the book of Acts came to its climax, that there had to be a quick end to it, or somebody else redacted an ending, because the end of Acts doesn't seem a whole lot like uh, the rest of Acts, and that the author of that was executed. Epaphroditus, Luke, Clement of Rome, Josephus, all ex, all cousins of the Emperor Domitian, and all executed at the same time, right at the ending of the book of Acts. So there we have it. Paul is evidently still alive at that time, or that's all the farther he got with it before uh, being uh, uh, before being executed. A uh, second thing, real quick. Acts has in chapter seventeen, I believe, in following the we section, and we read about Paul going around here and there. And the, the, the account of him traveling is written by an uh, a traveling companion of his who had this source as well. And then we read in one of Paul's letters that I left Epaphroditus sick someplace, and he writes to the Philippians, we've got to pray for Epaphroditus. He's in the middle of his journeys, and here Epaphroditus, in my estimation, is the one that wrote the story, because he's the only one that has the source of Paul's travels. All right. If you want to know about Epaphroditus, go ahead and look it up on my site. But um, that's why I believe the book of Acts ends so abruptly, abruptly because the author of the book of Acts ended so abruptly. So, um, so for those uh, people like me who might be skeptical of some of the things you've said, have you considered writing your own book or something? Yes, uh, I have. I've got all this stuff down. I just haven't written the book yet. But see, if you don't know the history, there's no way you can know any of this stuff. There is plenty of history about this. And there is no doubt that Paul was close to the Roman Empire, that he was not only close, but he was friends with the emperor. He, you know, he, he appeals to the emperor in Jerusalem because he knows the emperor. And Paul is, um, he is. Uh, he's, a he's a Herodian. Yeah, that's right. He's, he's a uh, Idumean and he is also related to the Herods. Paul's so, got a date up there. So if you could, uh, obviously this will take a lot of time. Now we uh, only but, do this now. I've already done it. It's in a but, podcast or two. But if you could basically compile everything you have, all the evidence you believe you have into a book format, and then you, know, you yeah. could maybe sell it or have it for a free PDF on your page. But that way, for people who might disagree, mm -hmm. but are at least trying to be open-minded to what you're saying, they can read what you're saying. And yeah, they it's just, it's they kind of like throwing a bomb in the middle of this discussion because it just happens to be something that I feel like I made some discoveries on. 
and uh, I, I can't articulate it as well as I'd like to, but there are so many different points of intersection between these people that there's got to be a connection. And I think you would even be uh, convinced of it too, if I put it all down like that. But let's, let's say, let's say I wasn't convinced. It, or let, me, let me put it differently. Let's say you were incorrect on some of your conclusions. Mm -hmm. It would be great to see how you're putting it together for other people like myself who might be, if we see some of the, like some of your points might be true, but some of them might be um, mm -hmm. inaccurate or not as compelling. So then I could point out of things that this argument I find compelling, this argument I don't. And then you could, it could potentially help fine tune your argument or maybe yeah, some of your right. particular ideas might be shown to be incorrect in certain ways. But I think it would be, I think it would be beneficial for you to put it all together sure. so we can see the total argument. And I've got it in podcasts so I can just write it out. But you know, I think, I, I really think that I know more about the secular Paul than anyone else in the world, except maybe a particular guy on here named uh -huh. Laverne. Oh, Laverne. I thought you were going to say Eisenman. <laughs> no, Laverne. Eisenman, I've gone way beyond him. But Laverne's got a, gone a long way, too. And, uh, yeah, that's something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. I just haven't found the time to do it. I thought, well, if I need money, that would fit perfectly in a niche market, and then everybody would want to spit on me. You can't denigrate Paul the, in any way, the founder of the Christian church, or you're coming in for persecution. Right, Laverne? He's probably asleep. No, no. Oh, let's drop that subject. Now you answer the question. Well, he... Why he, does the book of Acts end so abruptly? He unmuted himself if he wants to talk. Yeah, you will get persecuted. People will come against you if uh, you speak out against Paul. I, uh, I get an awful lot of that uh, in the last uh, video I uploaded. It, and it doesn't matter if you have a video that you're talking about, Paul. Paul, uh, or rather, people will call you a liar and a child of Satan, no matter what the topic. They'll always come back to, if you call Paul false, then everything you teach uh, you know you're a liar in that so yeah speaking against paul will bring people against you that's for sure thank you laverne you're a stand-up guy i'll just say to that i i think um i think that it's it should be allowed uh for people to question these things and for people who don't even allow this discussion, I think that is uh, not uh, righteous. Um, I would even go so far, I don't have absolute proof of this, but I would go so far to believe that in ancient Israel, when they, when they are um, putting someone to death, uh, you know, they have a trial. I believe that the person being put to death could have a final statement and say why they think they should be not, why they should not be put to death. Um, uh, try, trying to explain their point of view. And um, like, I always think we should allow the other side to share uh, their perspective. And in, with the issue of Paul in particular, the thing is, um, so for me, I've said before that I think it's spiritually dangerous in the sense of you have to be very convinced that you're right because if you're wrong um my, my perspective is that uh there, the sin of false accusation so for example if i make a claim about jackson and say that he uh had sex with a prostitute that's just something completely random that came to my mind, by the way. So if that, um, any uh, correspondence with the truth is just coincidence. Um, but uh, so basically, if I made that wild claim, I have no evidence for that whatsoever, but I am saying something that could be true, um, but it is 
if I don't have justification for it, then I would be in sin and for, for slander. Um, and so in that sense, for a personal, for, for a personal perspective, if you make accusations against Paul and you, on judgment day, you happen to be wrong, well then, depending, you know, the creator will judge your heart to see if you had justified reasons for coming to those conclusions. If you came to those conclusions incorrectly, based on um, whatever, uh, you could potentially be held uh, responsible uh, on Judgment Day. You know, we all be held account to what oh, we say. Uh, James definitely. James says every idle word we speak, uh, we will be held account. So um, I think that applies to whoever you accuse of something, whether it be Paul, uh, whether it be whoever. Uh, if you make an accusation against even, the, you know, your, your next door neighbor. So it's not... It's not about Paul specifically. It's about uh, people in general. If you make a claim and it's a false accusation, you could be uh, spiritually in danger of, of uh, something. But I don't think that that risk means you shouldn't be allowed to, to state your accusation. Um, and also, like when it comes to Paul, Paul is not a... Um, Paul is not the Messiah. He's not God, the creator or right. whatever. So if, if someone rejects Paul, that is not a capital crime. You go to the, you go to the law of Moses, you look at what are the, what are the capital punishments? There's no, Paul is false in it. There's no rejecting, uh, I, I'm not sure if rejecting a prophet uh, is a capital crime or not. Um, I think what it says is you need, Paul himself says, you need to judge those that prophesy in turn. But, oh, well, we, we do need Paul for spiritual gifts, for resurrection, well, for different doctrines like that, and for historical markers as well. We can't do without him for those things. But there is a lot of contradiction. Uh, let me just say, Laverne made a good point in the sense of um, you, will, you could also be held responsible spiritually um, for making the opposite claim, that so-and-so is a true prophet, uh, and he's not you could be leading people down a path of sin and, and destruction. Uh, so it, it definitely goes both ways. Um, That's because, why Laverne is going to be fried someday. He, well, he's going to be what? Fried in a pan. Um, so I, I definitely think that instead of, you know, saying, oh, you are condemning Paul, therefore I want nothing to do with you. Or, oh, you accept Paul, I want nothing to do with you. I think both those reactions are not productive. And I think it over it overemphasizes the issue. Um, whether Paul is false or not, the main importance is what you believe and what you do. So if you happen to believe incorrectly about Paul, but you are write about most of the things and you're living a holy life, there's a good chance that you will enter the kingdom. But if you are uh, wrong about, uh, if you are right about Paul, but you are living a, a wicked lifestyle, then you being right about that doesn't matter. Uh, in, the, in the long run, the way of your life will condemn you and ban you from the kingdom. Mm. So I, I think people, it's an important issue. And it's a very, like, I think it's a very important issue. Either way, if Paul's true, then it's important to defend him. If Paul's false, it's important to expose him uh, for the falsehood. Um, but Paul is not inherently a salvation issue. No. But it can lead to salvation issues depending on how you use, uh, like, 
what you do with that, like if you use Paul to justify wickedness, basically. Amen. Um, but I, I also want to say, I see a difference between, I also see a difference between someone saying that Paul is false and someone saying, I don't know if Paul is true. Um, because one is rejecting a, a flat out rejection, a Paul is this or is not this. The other is saying, I don't know, I'm still seeking, that type of thing. So that, that's important to make that distinction as well. But anyways, um, I should actually answer the question of, uh, of the book of Acts. Um, there's actually several things to say about this. One is, uh, this is a little bit different than what Jackson said, but I, I believe it could very well be that um, Acts, was, uh, Acts was written earlier uh, around the time of, I don't know, the 50s or whatever, or 60s. I, I don't know the exact chronology, but whenever the regular chronology implies it was uh, the time period, um, I think it could be uh, written, like, for example, if you're writing a book and you're still alive, you can't write what hasn't happened yet unless you're a prophet. So let's say Luke wrote the book of Acts. Well, if Luke was writing this account, he could only write up to the present day of yeah. when he was writing. So if, if, if Luke was alive at the time where the book of Acts ends, he couldn't write anything more. He would have to stop at that point because there's nothing more to say because, because he's caught up to where the present is. There's nothing more to say. Um, but the second thing is we, we've talked about scriptures being corrupted before. And scripture, by the way, means writings it doesn't necessarily mean uh the word of god divinely inspired so scripture or writing literature because latin the word in latin scripture means simply a book that has been written so scripture we know can be corrupted including holy scripture um so with the book of acts why did it end the way it did maybe it ended slightly differently there could have been a one paragraph extra which would have made it a perfect ending but maybe the scribe removed it because the final paragraph had something controversial in it who knows however uh at least for acts chapter 29 i don't see any evidence for the, for that being authentic from what i've seen for, there was a brief amount of time where i considered it perhaps authentic but uh the lack of manuscript evidence for me is a big deal i'm very much a, a manuscript person in the sense of I do believe in reconstruction, but if someone claims to have found something in a manuscript, there needs to be manuscript evidence to back it up. And if there's not manuscript evidence to back up that they found it in a manuscript, that's when you start to get into um, forgeries or fake books. A lot of the modern documents claiming to be ancient books are fake yeah. and because there's no manuscripts to support them. The Essene Gospel of Peace, uh, Gospel of the Twelve, these are all documents that the compilers or, or writers, the authors claim that these books either had a manuscript that once existed but was suddenly disappeared and no one can corroborate the account, or they even admit that, oh yeah, there was no manuscript, it was divinely revealed to me by uh, yeah. angels, uh, things like that. So, um, but the final thing to keep in mind is, have any of you tried to write a book or an essay and you're trying to write in a organized manner but as you're writing you get tired and exhausted and you start uh, going quicker and you're you start being less thorough and like in your in the beginning part of the book or article or whatever that you're writing you're very compact and it's very flowing and it makes sense uh it's altogether good but as you as you continue if you don't take a good not, amount of breaks um, you can start to get weary and, and uh, you start cutting corners and you, you don't, uh, you're not as careful anymore. So I've done that for myself. I have rushed things at, on the ending part of the book or a, a, something that I'm writing in, in a Word document because I'm human and I start to get tired and I'm, I get bored. So I start rushing and being quicker in what I'm saying. So if we keep in mind that the book of Acts is not the word of God, 
if, uh, in my belief, I believe most of the Bible is not the Word of God. Only the parts that claim to be the Word of God are the Word of God. The parts that don't, I don't accept as the Word of God. I might accept that they're divinely inspired in the sense of inspiration. Like uh, if someone sees a movie or reads an amazing book or sees a painting and they say, wow, that, that just really inspires me. Or your, your testimony inspired me. It touched me. That's the inspiration that the scriptures have, the whole of scriptures have, in my belief. Um, like letters, uh, um, the letter of, of Peter or letter of James in the New Testament. I would say the letters of Paul as well, but for people who don't agree with Paul, let's just stick with the people we do agree with, James, Peter, John, their letters. The, those apostles were inspired by God in the sense that they, they were familiar with the, the, the things that God did. They were moved by it. But that doesn't mean God said, okay, say these words, or those are my words, and, and the Holy Spirit is speaking those words into those books. For me, that's my belief. So when it comes to the book of Acts, I don't believe the book of Acts was the Holy Spirit saying, okay, write these words. Blah, blah, blah. I think it was whoever wrote it, like Luke, for example, he was writing it as a regular human, and a regular human writing it could write it in a bad way, imper imperfectly. Um, Laverne was just talking about this the other day, uh, no, earlier today, I mean, um, regarding what the New Testament was written. Uh, was it written in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic? And with the issue of Paul, what's interesting is um, depending what language Paul was written in, was it written in Hebrew? Did, did Paul write his letters originally in Hebrew or Aramaic or was it in Greek? Well, if it was in Greek, the scholars tell us that Paul's Greek is atrocious. Um, the, the, the Greek of Paul's letters is bad Greek. That's what the scholars say. If that's true, because I'm not fluent in Greek myself. It's not that's, true. So, yeah. Um, but if that was true, mm -hmm. that, I would have to look into that. Um, but that would be an example of Paul writing bad Greek wouldn't invalidate what he says uh, inherently. It, it, mean, it would mean it's not the word of God but it would mean that he's a human writing his own words. How many of us have written a book and made typos, mistakes? Who's to say that a writer of scripture couldn't have made a mistake in the original? They could have made a typo, but it, of course it wouldn't be a typo, but they could have misspelled words. They could have accidentally not included a word they were supposed to in their original document that they published. Because we have editors. The ancients didn't have editors in the same way moderns do. So they could easily have made mistakes in the original writings. Um, so the book of Acts, whoever wrote it, it could have ended it that way because the writer of Acts was just not always a good writer in certain places. So those are different possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my take on it. Uh, Jackson, uh, Laura asked a question that I think is great uh, in the uh, message section. Okay. So I think that would be the next one we should do. Looking forward here. Do you see it, Jackson? You, I'll, I'll have you go. I'm looking at, looking around here, but I don't see it. Oh, is this? It's a little bit up. It's a. Uh, is it's this the one about the uh, spiritual gift? Yeah. Do you all believe? Of course, she's opening the question to everybody here, but also oh, in particular. Okay. Uh, me and you could share our thoughts, and then other people can chime in as well. Oh, all so right. You, how about you go first, Jackson? Uh, it, does it start out the word of knowledge? Yeah. Do you all believe that God still exists, uh, still speaks to us today through the word of knowledge or the word of wisdom? Yeah, and I'll Holy, I'll start on that. I and absolutely. The Holy Spirit do. and the gifts of tongues. I believe in in these these particular gifts in First Corinthians twelve are called pneumatikoi. That is spiritual things. They're different than charismata, which we find in Romans 12. But as for the spiritual things, these are what have been called power evangelism gifts. Yes, um, in my family and experience all my life, these have been in operation and still are. Um, and... This, this goes to the 
question about inspiration, by the way. I was just going to write this up, but I didn't get it done. And that is, I don't see that scripture, sacred writings, can be determined as sacred writings because a committee says they are. Because uh, uh, there are numerous sacred writings that the committee, I'm talking about the Council of Laodicea in, in the end of the fourth century, threw out that, or destroyed that have come to uh, the fore in these last 150 years that are tremendously inspired, but they're so Jewish. So the way I've come about learning how to hear the word in scripture is I want the Spirit to inspire me to read it. I will read along in the Scripture, whether it be in the Bible or not, and all of a sudden I'll read a portion that just lights up, just like you light up in a spiritual gift. If you've ever been baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's a visceral experience. You feel it in your body, you feel it in your mind, it's something you can say, yes, I know, because I have experienced this. It's the same way with me and Scripture. And it could be that some are inspired at some time, and they're not inspired at another time. It depends on what the Holy Spirit is doing with you now, not 10 years ago, not when you were a child, what is going on now. So I don't pay any attention to the Jewish canon or the Protestant canon or any of that stuff. Like, like Andrew, I read them all, and I do so with the hope and prayer that if there's something in there for me, word of knowledge, uh, word of wisdom, or, or prophecy, it will come out lit up it will come out, and I'll have the visceral feeling of knowing, as Yahshua said of the apostles, you don't need any teacher anymore. You have the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to teach you. However, most people will claim that they do when they really don't. So that's where I am with this now. I was, uh, I spent years and years and years searching for canon. And especially once I got into a more ta um, Torah-centric mindset, the whole idea of the men's canon just went away. And you know, I've done a lot of work in apocryphal writings, lots and lots of that in the last 30 years. And uh, there are some things that are very inspired in some of these books. I feel like Barnabas is certainly an inspired book. The Didache is without a doubt inspired, yet these things were destroyed in the time that they put forth the canon uh, for the Catholic Church because they were just too Jewish. They were too Torah-centric in, in an age when they were trying to get away from that. So pray for the inspiration of the Spirit when you read the, the the words, and gee, you might even get something out of the Book of Mormon, for that matter. Uh, you, you don't know. The Holy Spirit can inspire any kind of text to you. And when you get used to knowing what that feels like, then you can rest assured that's for you for that day. Thank you. Um, some so my perspective is a little different in the sense of, um, well, especially in regards to tongues, I do not believe in the gift of tongues as it's traditionally understood. Um, you don't see really anywhere in scripture that tongues uh, are languages that nobody knows. Um, when, you, when you experience it, you will not have a doubt about it. <laughs> Well, all I can say is from an outsider perspective um, and from a logical perspective, of course, you know, many people will say these things are not logically based, but um, 
I think, you know, people will appeal to the scriptures and say, see, the, the, it says gift of tongues here. But when you go to the context of those documents, every time you see the tongues ha occur, it is actual human languages, and it is um, a way of communicating to someone else that you don't know the language, but you don't know the language through your through natural means, but through spiritual power, you are somehow able to know this language. Um, I'll give you an example of something comparable to this um, through nature, through science, which is interesting. Um, there have been instances where people have had major brain damage. They wake up not being able to yeah. talk in, in their native language. They're talking in another language, um, but it's an actual language. Um, but it's a language they may have learned before, but sometimes they never learn the language. They, never learned it. They, they, their brain heard people talk it, and if, it, it seemed like gibberish to them, but their brain actually was, was saving those words and due to the brain damage, it caused a something connected and the brain was able to super intelligently take those memories and form the meaning of the words and enable that person to speak in that language. So I believe the gift of tongues is comparable to that brain damage where they somehow they have this ability. But I don't believe from at least from what I see uh, that there is evidence in the scriptures anyway for the concept of speaking in tongues that um, is a language unknown to anyone. And I will say that um, there have been studies, of course, you know, th these are from people who don't believe in the gift of tongues, but there have been studies of tongues and they concluded that it it is very reminiscent of gibberish in the sense that there's no there's not really um and i don't i don't have um sources by the way to back that up i'm just speaking from my memory so uh, i would have to i would have to look that up uh for any specific studies but i pretty i'm pretty sure i remember hearing or reading about uh people who have looked into it and they have seen that it doesn't have the syntax of a normal language. Um, you know, languages have a certain flow and like uh, there's like a rhythm to it and um, a regularity of patterns of sounds. Um, and if if and if a language that's being if, if someone's talking and claiming to speak in a in a in an unknown language, if it doesn't have any of the marks of a language, and by all appearances it's just gib gibberish, then um, the burden of proof would be on the people saying it's a, it's a real language. But of course, a lot of people will still stick to it and say, I have faith that I'm speaking uh, in the tongue. Well, you know, we, we've got, we got to, our time is up, but I would sure like to address that next time. Well, I thought we were going to 1030. We're only going to uh, Oh, 10 we can go to 1030. Well, yeah, what, what, do, what do you want to do? Uh, I just looked what, at my what, watch and I thought it was a quarter after. We've gone over an hour, but why why not if nobody disagrees you're right i think on the event i said 10 30 didn't i yeah okay um and then laverne says he he says he agrees based on the uh comparison of kundalini um the african oh, languages uh yeah i yeah and then now in regards that, that that was a multiple part question so in regards to word of knowledge word of wisdom or gift of prophecy. I believe those things are still in force, but I believe that their occurrence is far less than is claimed. Um, I believe I believe that in general the creator leaves hints for us, like like a little here, a little there, like maybe signs, things like that. But I don't believe that he actually speaks to anyone except for few individuals. I believe that there are um, there are some individuals where he speaks to them as a true prophet. Now, um, now there is the ascension, uh, which or excuse me, the Pentecost, which 
you know, the Holy Spirit came down and spread. And so many people say that because of that, all people have uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but if I could recall correctly, I'd have to look at it again, but I believe that these gifts, the Holy Spirit descended upon uh, the apostles, but then the Holy Spirit only transferred to another person when they laid, when the apostles laid their hands on that person and baptized them into the church. So it was a, it's a transmission, um, and it's not to all people who believe. It's it, you have to have someone impart the Holy Spirit to you. I believe I'd have to I'd have to do more research on that. But um, so I'm not saying I'm 100% convinced on that. But in general, I don't trust anybody claiming that they have the Holy Spirit because so many times I've seen them make false claims. And so many times what they say contradicts the Apocrypha scriptures, things like that. It's not scriptural because nobody can have the Holy Spirit in the first place. If you read the, if you read the text in the original language, there's a lot of interpolation in there. Yeah, so I, for, for me, there's too much ambiguity. There's too much subjectivity for people claiming that they have the Holy Spirit or that the Holy Spirit speaks to them. I do not discount that the Holy Spirit speaks to some people. But I'm very skeptical of those people making those claims because so many times the nature of those claims is very vague and ambiguous. Like there's no real way to confirm that those things are truly the Holy Spirit versus them making things up in their head. Um, I've known of people like at my dad's church, uh, my, my parents' church, there was a guy that used to go there and he claimed to have words of knowledge so often the majority of the time his words of knowledge were taking verses from the bible and then telling you uh commentary on those verses so with things like that the problem is it can be interpreted in two ways it can be interpreted oh well i believe it's the holy spirit therefore it's the word you know word of knowledge on the other hand it can be explained naturally by them simply doing a commentary on scripture. And it's a, it's, a, it's a cheat because if you say that that person's not speaking the word of God, then you're, and they say, but I'm, all I'm saying, it, well, I'm just quoting the scripture. So of course it's the word of God. Like that's like a loophole in a sense. Um, but it doesn't take the Holy Spirit to give the commentary. And why is it that the Holy Spirit always tells these people what they already believe um, or beliefs that oh. agree with their general church doctrine. Um, so I am very skeptical of people claiming to have the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have somebody who says they have the Holy Spirit and they're saying things, there's no way they could know. You know, if they're if they're coming up to you and saying, when you were when you were a uh, five years old, so and so abused you, um, and you've been holding in this whole time, you haven't told anyone, and I want you to know, blah blah blah. That people have said that that's happened before. In those cases, it's pretty hard to argue that that's not the Holy Spirit or some, some miraculous intervention from spiritual realm to reveal that kind of information. That's not, you can't really guess that. But if someone says, you know, the Holy Spirit revealed to me that uh, Jesus is God. Well, that isn't compelling because that's an interpretation of scripture you're just you're just spouting your own beliefs and then believing maybe sincerely you sincerely believe it's the holy spirit telling you this but it really can be naturally explained so something that can be naturally explained versus like something that doesn't require a divine explanation we should by default assume that there was not a divine explanation something that requires a divine explanation that's when we should say okay that must be God there because there's no way that could just happen without God. I think that's the best way to approach it. That's how I approach it. That's and then some people made statements. Uh, um, Melissa said, wait, hold on. One second. Um, I think that's a matter of semantics. To say I've got the Holy Spirit, as opposed to I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I think that it just because of the interpolation of the Catholic Church into the New Testament, 
putting in the definite article, the Holy Spirit, throughout the New Testament. If you go back to the Old Testament, it, like in Psalm 51, it says, and take not the Holy Spirit from me. However, that's not what it says in Hebrew. It takes, take not a Holy Spirit from me. There's a human spirit. There's the Holy Spirit. We got this idea from the Pentecostals that the Holy Spirit comes in and lives in your body along with your spirit. See, there's confusion there, primarily because of, again, the mistranslation of the Greek text and how it's come into, uh, into a form of doctrine through, again, the Catholic Church. Um, I did want to say that um, there are things in the Gospels that people twist um, into what I believe is twisting anyway. Um, for example, the passages would say, um, have the Messiah saying, you will do things greater than I have done. In other words, you know, the Messiah did many miracles, and then he, he said, you will do greater things. So people take that and say, well, that means believers will do greater things. But that does not what it says. If you look at the text, he's clearly addressing his, his direct successors, his apostles. He's saying, you, 12 apostles, will do greater things than I have done. He's not saying all the believers who have the Holy Spirit from now until the time I come back will do greater things than I have done. He's specifically addressing his 12 disciples and saying they will do greater things. And what we see is that in the Apocrypha documents, there's, there's acts of different apostles. Now, you know, you could argue that some of these documents um, are not... Um, you could argue that some of these documents are not uh, as reliable as others. But in these documents, the apostles do some crazy stuff that's unbelievably amazing if they actually did it. If they did these things, these Apocrypha Acts say that these apostles did, these are definitely greater things than the Messiah ever did on earth mm -hmm. uh, during his three-year ministry. There's just like, you know, raising people constantly from the dead, there's all kinds of weird stories where it, it's shocking stuff that if ha if it happened is um, greater than what the Messiah did. But but remember the context of the original writings. Some things that the New Testament or the Old Testament says are not talking about all believers, but people twist it to refer to all believers. Um, for example, one verse commonly quoted is, all we like sheep have gone astray. People will quote that verse and say, all humans have gone astray. But that is not what the passage says. It, this is Isaiah talking about Israel in the ancient time. Israel at that time period had gone astray. So Isaiah was speaking from the perspective of ancient Israel, saying all we Israelites have gone astray. He's not saying all people who have ever lived have gone astray and sinned and need a, a savior. So that's just one of the many, many ways that people twist scripture by taking what was originally a very specific target group, an audience, or a focus of reference, and then they start applying it to other groups that it's not intended to be applied to. You could take things that Paul writes. Paul was writing to very specific churches, and he was addressing certain issues. We don't have the full context of Paul's letters. Some things he was addressing might have been very specific to that church. And yet people will take that letter and say, oh, well, Paul said this for that church, therefore it applies to everybody. But that might be a false leap of logic. Of course, if you don't accept Paul, that's a, that's a bad logic, because Paul, what Paul say would just be his opinion. But if you accept Paul as reliable, at the same time, you can't believe that everything he says is referring to everybody. There, there's, a, there's a passage in one of the letters of Paul where it says, bring the cloak I left, or bring the, bring the parchments I left at so-and-so's place. That was a very specific thing. And then another thing was Paul said, say hi to your grandma Lois. Uh, he was talking to Timothy. So I can tell you that if you have a grandmother named Lois, or you have a grandmother in general, you shouldn't take that passage and say, oh, I, should, I better say hi to my grandma, because Paul, Paul said you need to say hi to your, 
you need to say all hi Cretans to are liars. What what's that about? All Cretans are liars. And then he says, This is true. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the common uh I have, a, I have a question, Jackson and Onya. Um, yeah. Melissa's putting some scriptures in the chat. If someone would like to address those, because Jackson, you did make a very good point in the retort when you said the is is not in there. But if you could address the three scriptures, because she has said that she has put three scriptures that refute what you have said and you're not addressing it. So, first John, John 14. All of them. Oh, I'm looking at them. First Corinthians. I to address them. Um, what I was saying there is that through Catholic interpolation in the Greek and Latin text, a definite article is put on before Numa Hagios, Holy Spirit, to make it, and then it's capitalized in the Bible as the Holy Spirit, as though the Holy Spirit was some ghost flying around here and there um i'm just saying that there was there's no definite article it should be taken out it really says a holy spirit well and i that, also want to say oh keep going jackson sorry well that makes a big difference in one's theology but the same I, one hovered above the face of the waters when on the day of creation when he was creating you know, wait, what does it say in Genesis? Say, yeah, in the I say Holy God, Spirit, but like I said, I don't want to argue with anybody. I want to, I want to celebrate the diversity. The face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Well, I'm just saying that it doesn't say a Holy Spirit. Well, you know who he is. Not necessarily. Like, Kadesh. I mean, the there's word, not. Now, wait a minute. The word there, Ruach means three or four different things it um, means a wind or a breeze as well as spirit and it means a breath too let me just say something to clarify here yep. um i i believe people need to, to interpret based on on uh their own beliefs their experiences and such like that so in other words um if any of you claim to have had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, it is not my job to go through all your encounters and say, oh, that one wasn't the Holy Spirit. That one was. Da, 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 da. That's for you. You know, that's between you and the creator. Um, it's, not, it's not my purpose to say all your experiences are not authentic. What, I can, what I can say, though, is that <laughs> you can't expect other people to believe well, those experiences well you've got a corrupted bible that's a problem right there i'm just saying it's there's probably 10 scriptures i can print to I you know, right? but it's I corrupted know. well okay and i bet so many people going to all these different churches that i've traveled through 10 years i didn't stay with one church i went all over and i met all kinds of people that had very similar supernatural uh, experiences Oh, so I'm not talking about the experience. I'm only talking oh, about I'm what it's called. There. I well, mean, let's just say that I've had the some, experience too, many times. some of those experiences may have been authentic, but some of them may have not been. So from an outsider's perspective, because I have not had those experiences for myself. Well, get on so, your face and tell God you're sorry for being a dirty sinner and get on your face and cry when you're broken. I and only come. get it right this time. <laughs> All right. That's yeah, what I, I, I should do that. I agree. But he only came to me when I was on the bottom of the bottom of the bottom and had nowhere to go. And I turned to him and there he was. And it just, I got the Holy Spirit. I can't lie. And anybody will tell you, I mean, there's no way I could have just completely walked away from everything, every sin and device in my life. I, I had no desire for cigarettes ever again. I had no desire for alcohol, no desire for anything. It was like, he just literally bam, he hit me with something. I don't, and I was just like, wow, that was awesome. So, I mean, I had yeah, it's good baptized in the Holy Spirit. When, when Yeshua says you must be born again, that's what I think he's talking about. I think you have to have it happen. So you better be born again. You have, <laughs> I don't you know, know if you haven't given up your sins yet. You're still holding on or something. You got to let no, them. 
no, you know, no, and, and here's the way that I, I, I kind of understand it even, you know, yes, being baptized in the set apart Ruach to be led by him and taught by him, by our spirit that is in us, that he teaches us how to yeah. grow yeah. in a, in, in a spiritual uh, maturity uh, for him to dwell or be set apart Ruach to dwell in us. We are completely unclean, whether mm-hmm. you say that sin or not, or that we're sinners and we need to get on our faith. Well, a lot of us do. Now, we're still unclean as we are in the flesh for the set apart spirit. To Romans 8 live. verse 9 says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So what that's Bible are you reading from? Yeah. That's yeah. A lot of people don't like books. They don't want to have this. You've got God a corrupted in. Bible. So let me <laughs> get are you reading out of a flesh? Are you kidding me? Prophetic translation, correct? It's James. I can read it. It doesn't it's, matter. Yeah. It's any one of them. That's what the Septuagint. Well, can I say? Can no. I say? Can Don't I say? One thing? Greek. I just want to say. Not worth arguing um, about. I I think there's difference between saying that you have the Holy Spirit in the sense of the Holy Spirit led you to repentance and living a, a righteous life that is something much more uh i think that is a legitimate thing you know but i think it's different if you say you have the holy spirit and you're speaking prophecy i think that's a different issue because now you're claiming to speak the actual words of the creator so that's a different level so when I, when when laura was, was asking the question earlier when laura was asking the question of um well, Yeshua said That's that the, the question. prophet was until John, and since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and all men presseth into it. You so we're in the kingdom. We're in the kingdom now. I was translated oh. the kingdom of his dear son. We've got I mean, a different hermeneutic here. <laughs> you're in a problem. different realm. And, and I'm here, in the uh, There's no kingdom. You're very plain spoken. It's translated in the kingdom. Okay, but it's time to stop now. We'll pick this up next time. <laughs> All right, before things okay. get out of hand. Wait, 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 wait. stand the pressure, Jackson. Wait, wait. wait. hey, Jackson. I can stand the pressure. Hold I just get mad after a while. No, no. Okay, okay but can't get... what, what, one thing that our that our guests need to understand is that the way of the Yahad and the, to be in a scene or a way, a follower of the way is to you respect why the other person is talking. Other people you don't laugh at, so you don't laugh at someone. And yes, we should answer all the questions until it is. It shouldn't be fighting. We should uh, address the scriptures that she posted. And of course, we do now know that it is a King James translation. But to laugh and to try to talk over, that, that, gets, that gets nowhere for future reference. And next time I'll say it again if it happens again. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that up in the, in the, at the beginning next time. But we do have to go now. It's been an hour and a half. Uh, one of the things we want to do is keep things within the time because when we get more people, they're going to start falling off and then we're going to end up just in these long discussions. So uh, I want to thank you all for coming. This is a very good session. Andrew, you did a wonderful job and uh, appreciate all the chiming in that you all did. Thank you guys for sharing. And Jackson, you did you, you you did okay, Jackson. You're all right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you and good night. See you Shalom, next. Shalom, guys. Week. See you have in the great, morning. Have a great weekend. Bye.